who are you and what do you do? Right, my name's Mick Timpson. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, my specialism in architecture is placemaking and urban design. Uh, when I'm not doing that, uh, I work as an artist occasionally, uh, and I'm also a yoga teacher as well. So you've mentioned you're an architect, you're a master planner and an artist. How do you navigate the change of scale between these three disciplines? That's a really, really good question. It, it's, the, it's the change of scale which I think is crucial because with a change of scale comes a different way of thinking. So, for instance, if you're a master planning architect, you're having to think strategically all the time, um, not worrying too much about buildings and how they work, but knowing very clearly about a building footprint and a volume and a form, which you know will work eventually further down the line. It's, yeah, it's about knowing how to think at different scales, what you can put aside and worry about later, and what you, can, what you need to solve at that moment. And at that scale, it is about the city. It is about places and the town and, and everything else that goes with it. It's a challenge. On the theme of master planning, uh, you were heavily involved with the reconstruction of the city centre after the IRA bomb in 1996. How do you approach such a project, and do you think it's been successful in regenerating the city centre? Right. That, that's, uh, yeah, well... Look outside the window. I mean, I think yeah, Manchester has has you know flourished. I think since the bomb went off, what that really required, and that's what Manchester is really known for, is very very strong political leadership, uh, very strong leadership all the way across the council. Um, so, when you're master planning at this scale, you need someone who's going to be the champion of change. You need to be able to provide a strong vision from the outset, really, which then people feel comfortable to, to invest in. And, you know, Manchester, I mean, I'm, you know, you can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm as south as you can get, you know, I was born down on the south coast. And, um, but Manchester, I think, has shown many, many cities the way forward in thinking about how to build a different sort of place, a more economically successful place. In more recent times, uh, which modern building or urban design scheme do you think has had the biggest impact on Manchester and why? Good question. The, well, a lot of us talk about the Manchester style uh, and we know what that is. You know, that, the setup by people like um, Roger Stevenson and uh, um, there is this, this wonderful feeling for the industrial heritage of the city, the red brick, the steel, the glass uh, and that you can see that everywhere. We've moved on from that now, I think, you know, with, with, um, with Simpson's uh, uh, Beetham Tower, we've got a different iconography in the city, a different sort of feeling. The law courts, Denton Corker Marshall, isn't it? Brilliant. Absolutely love that building. And that brought something new to Manchester. That brought probably a sort of more of an international feel for how urban problems could be solved. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's probably that and the, and the, the School of Music are my two favourite buildings in the city. You often draw upon the idea of spontaneity when you work. What does that mean and how is it useful? Right, that, that's brilliant. Spontaneity is the thing for me. Um, when I look back now from where I am in my career, when I look back at all the architects I've always been interested in, it's been architects who draw. So I've really bought into that. I've bought into the fact that, that um, one of the absolutely crucial things any architect must do is learn to tap into the intuitive, to learn to tap into spontaneity. Um, that's what makes us special, if you like. Musicians have it, poets have it, writers, painters, they all have it uh, to some degree. And architects do it as well. And the way we tap into that, that flow, if you like, is through drawing is through confronting a white piece of paper with a fat pen and just, just doing it, just drawing. Alto talks about exactly that. He talks about understanding a client's needs and the programme and what needs to happen and then very carefully putting that to one side at the back of your mind and then just drawing, knowing that, that whatever comes out of that massive drawing, those massive lines on the paper, that's the universal substance. 
And it is shaped by an unconscious link to what we do as architects, knowing how a program needs to work, knowing how a place needs to come together. Uh, and so for, you've got to keep drawing, you've got to keep drawing. And, um, and eventually you will get that sort of, you know, you'll tap into solutions very, very quickly. Um, and it's, it's almost a meditative state, which is where my interest in yoga comes in. It's, it's, it's letting go and drawing, seeing what happens. So on the subject of hand drawing, do you think the invention of computers has changed things, and for better or for worse? Right. Um, well, in my office, we have computers. Um, my, I use Photoshop all the time. Um, I use Illustrator, uh, a little bit of SketchUp. Um, I'm a generation of architects, which I, I, mean, I suppose I've always been lucky because I've never really had to worry about learning how to use CAD because I've always been able to draw and conceptualise quickly. But, you know, that's not to say that the architects, they need those skills now. They need those skills. What I worry about is, is that computers sort of disconnect you. You know, there are too many young architects, student architects, you know, going straight onto the computer and exploring via the keyboard and the mouse, whatever. Now, that's fine, but once you, you lose the tactility of, of holding the piece of charcoal or the paintbrush or the pen or the pencil in your hand on paper, that, you know, that's part of the thinking process. That's part of the creativity process, the art of making. And I think computers sort of get in the way of that. A little bit. For me, the, the ideas making is a physical, mental thing and not a digital thing, really. So turning to your art, um, as we've mentioned, you're an award-winning artist. What sort of art do you produce? What are you trying to achieve? And how does it affect your work as an architect? Right, right, that's good. The, I suppose the art I produce is um, God, it's really hard to pin it down but it it's architectonic you know it you can see in it an architecture um, the art I produce is really just purely again about the process of making it uh, you never set off with thinking I'm going to do this I'm going to make that it, the stuff just evolves and, and comes out of whatever it is you're doing the um, it's a combination of drawings and assemblage and the assemblage is basically stuff I find in skips you know, that I spend all my time walking around South Manchester, dragging home bits of chair and bed and all sorts of things I find in skips. Um, and then the drawing comes with it or before it or after it. I mean, it all depends, you know, what, what's happening at the time. Yeah, so it's about assembling things and, and out of it begins to emerge a sort of, you know, I mean, I've called it spontaneous places. It, it, they look and feel like an architectural proposition and they begin to have a sort of you know some of them morph into buildings some into landscape you know I can see in there and then once that happens they start to compose themselves you know so the, these pieces start to shape um, you know so once you think well this is looking a bit like a sort of pump house you know and then you start thinking oh well you know maybe other bits start to come in and start to elaborate on the program so there's a sort of there's a sort of hidden thing in it, uh, and it's all architectural. And I suppose what I hope to achieve, I mean, really, it's like all art. It, it, it just keeps you off the streets and keeps you happy. Your work has appeared in numerous public exhibitions, and you hold the unofficial record for the most summer show exhibits at the Royal Academy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what role should an architect or designer play in the public realm? And how should we go about engaging with members of the public? Right, that, that is terrific. Um, well, that, that we could spend all day answering that question. The, I suppose, for me, the role of the architect in the public realm is, is to be um, not so much the conscience of, of, of the city, but the, you know, the enabler of change. You know, if we accept that change is the only thing we're ever sure of you know, and, and that you know I suppose that's probably true then the architect is part of that process that the architect must enable that process to happen for the greater good so um, you know I, I can be quite 
um, mean sometimes to some of my fellow architects um, uh, about the, the concentration of thinking about buildings purely as objects and nothing else. I think that that doesn't help us at all. It doesn't help the profession at all. You know, we are we are builders of place and we are the makers of change, and that's what's exciting, I think, for for to be an architect. We still don't get very good coverage in the media, really, um, and and therefore I think you know there aren't any drama programs made about architects. Loads of drama programs made about lawyers and doctors. You know, not many about architects. So we either must be really dark, or you know, nobody knows we exist. So, so I don't know. So I don't know how we do that. I mean, people would say, well, we build buildings out in the street. That's how we communicate with with the people uh, in the city. So there's a lot to do, I think, in that. You've also taught in university. In your opinion, can design be taught? And what are the best methods of teaching in a design environment? Right, right. Design can be taught, I think. Yes, it can be. Um, what probably can't, well, what probably can be half taught is getting students to engage with the creative process. Now, that is really hard, and that's the role of the teacher, I think, to be able to expose. Uh, students to a different way of thinking, to a different way of seeing the world. Now that's really, really hard, which is why I think, you know, two degrees in architecture, if done correctly, is a little bit like a spiritual journey. You know, you suddenly, you, you evolve into somebody who sees the world in a different way and operates in a different way. That's, that's right up there with, with what we should be doing. We've all got creativity, all of us. We're all creative. What we need to do is learn the techniques to access that creativity, and that's where you either fail or succeed, really. I'm a great believer in that. Everybody can do anything they want, but it's down to the school and down to the tutor to get people to engage with their own creativity. So, yeah, to, to be able to teach, you need to, first of all, lead by example. You know, you need to be able to do it. You need to be able to sort of sit down in a tutorial and draw uh, and discuss and talk, uh, and that's absolutely vitally important. And then you need to take people with you. You need to show people that that you that your life is fulfilled and energetic and creative because you study this discipline. And finally, uh, what advice do you have for architecture students? Right, <laughs> buy a sketchbook. That's, that's the first piece of the, uh, advice I, I, I'd give you. Um, I, I, would, I would take with a pinch of salt the philosophy that comes with all architectural um, schools in that you're now an architect, you have to live and breathe architecture. Don't go down that route because that makes for a very unhappy life, really. Have a creative life. And architecture is part of that. Uh, but don't believe that you have to live and breathe buildings 24 hours a day because there are so many other brilliant things out there for architects to be involved with. You know, so um, by all means, study, be an architect because it's still the most best thing in the world to be. But then think about, right, where is it going to take me? Am I going to become interested in writing? Am I going to be a filmmaker? Am I going to produce buildings? Am I going to produce master plans? Am I going to produce landscapes? Am I going to make floating cities off the coast of you know, Manhattan, whatever? You know, all of these things are really, really interesting. So, so be broad, because that's what architecture is. Architecture is a massive subject. So take it and think, where am I going to go with all of this stuff, all of this information? So I would do that. I'd think broadly, um, and I would always carry around with you a little box of colouring pencils and a couple of pens uh, and buy a moleskin and uh, you'll be fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome.